All right, we're going to do a very, very detailed study of the subject of the judgment seat of Christ. Um, if you're not aware of this, if you're newly saved or whatever, um, everybody that's ever lived is going to be judged by God when they meet Him. Uh, the lost will be judged and condemned to hell and then ultimately to the lake of fire. Uh, saved people, they'll have their own judgment. But uh, it's not, well, you get up there and you were saved, but you didn't do quite enough good stuff, so you have to go to hell. Sorry. No, that's not the God we serve. Okay, uh, the judgment that we will be hitting as Christians is where our works, what we've done after our salvation, those works are going to be judged. So we're going to do a two-part study on this, big study. I originally preached this in 2011, so over six years ago. But let's, uh, let's get started here. Romans chapter 14, we're going to be going over quite a few scriptures today in this study. Uh, there's a lot to talk about. Romans chapter 14, verse 7. It says here, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. Okay? What you do with your life affects other people. And the Bible also calls us ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We're ministers of the gospel. So the Lord works through Christians. He'll set up times when you can witness to people and things like that. You know, we call those things like kind of like divine appointments. Look at verse 8 and 9. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. Okay? You know, and again, understand that you are bought. Uh, by the Lord. You are His property. So you are the Lord's. Uh, whatever you do, you are you belong to God when you get saved as a Christian. And that's one of the big reasons why a lot of lost people don't want to get saved is because they don't like the idea of being owned. I don't want to be a slave. I don't want somebody telling me what to do with my life. I do. Because for years and years I tried to do things my own way and I always messed up. So I think it's a blessed thing to have the God of Heaven owning me and telling me what I'm to do with my life. It's a good thing. Look at verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Okay? Now, you can judge another Christian. Right? There's things we need to correct each other on and things like that. But don't waste all of your time on it and forsake the work of Christ. Okay, uh, there's a lot of situations like that where people will draw you into these long, drawn-out arguments and stuff, and it's just like, is this really fruitful? Uh, that's why I don't do debates, because debates are pretty much pointless, in my opinion. You have two people that have their minds made up coming together to argue, and both sides that support whichever person, both sides are going to come away saying, our guy won. I mean, I've never once seen any debate. I've watched a few of them. And I've never once seen any debate where somebody just at the end just quit and said, you know what, you've convinced me, you're right. I'm, I'm going to abandon my position. You're right, thank you. You beat me in the debate. I've never seen that. It's a pride fest, right? Um, we're all going to be standing before the judgment seat of Christ. And that should be a great comfort to you, by the way, too. Uh, there are Christians that are messed up doctrinally. I understand that. I don't certainly say that people have to understand and believe everything that I believe and teach and preach and whatever. A lot of people are ignorant, but, uh, you know, and I'm not saying I'm 100% right either. I'm not saying I know everything. I've never made mistakes. If you've been watching me for a while, you've seen me make plenty of mistakes. <laughs> but uh, the whole point is, every one of us is going to stand before Jesus Christ one day. Every single one of us. And when we get there to heaven, we're going to have the mind of Christ. We shall know even as we are also known. 1 Corinthians 13 talks about that. Titus chapter 3 verses 9 through 11 says, But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and striving about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. All right. If somebody is saved, genuinely saved, the Lord's going to straighten them out, okay? And if not in this life, they're going to get there to heaven, they're going to understand some things, and they're going to see some of the rewards getting burned up, okay? I'll just say this right at the beginning. 
The judgment seat of Christ is not going to be a bawling out session where the Lord just says, you did this and you did that, and he's yelling at you and stuff like that. No, it's not going to be like that. You say, oh, whew, good, then we don't have to worry. Oh, uh, well, actually, you're going to see from this study, um, there's going to be some suffering at the judgment seat of Christ. You're going to realize how much time you waste that you could have been serving Jesus Christ. You and me. How many times... You could have looked at the Bible, read the Bible instead of looking at that magazine or that catalog or some other book that's not related to Scripture. You know what I mean? How many times you could have been singing a hymn instead of singing some secular worldly song to yourself? How many times you could have listened to hymns or listened to the Bible being read or some other thing? How many times you could have put a track someplace but you were too busy? That's what's going to come up at the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to see that in this study. All right? God's not going to, you know, Lord's not going to be there screaming at you and straightening you out, you know, doctrinally, whatever. You're going to get there to heaven and you're going to receive the mind of Christ and it's going to be all of a sudden like, oh, wow. Romans 14, verses 11 through 12. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. You're going to give an account of yourself. I'm going to give account of myself to God. Kind of a sobering thought. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll go to another passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Who can give me a nice hearty amen to that one? <laughs> you know, get rid of this old body of flesh. I mean, uh, I'll just tell you just kind of a thing, if you hear me kind of, uh, wheezing a little bit. Uh, I got hit with this like massive sickness yesterday. I don't even know what in the world happened. I didn't eat anything bad, any junk food or anything like that. Uh, I wasn't outside in the rain or anything. I mean, it was just like, bam, and I was really, really, really sick. It was like the flu, I think, or something. And uh, thankfully, the Lord's helped me to get into natural health and eating, so it didn't really last that long, but it was bad. It was real bad. And, uh, I'm real anxious to get a body that doesn't get sick. You know, um, by the grace of God, I've been able to fight off the thing of headaches uh, where I don't get them that much. I do still get some, but uh, I used to struggle horribly with headaches. I'm looking forward to having a body that I don't need to worry about headaches anymore. And not only that, but I'm also anxious to be actually in the Lord's presence. I walk by faith, not by sight right now. So do you as a Christian. You can't say Jesus. Anybody that tells you that, oh, they, I saw Jesus. No, they didn't. Okay. We can't see Jesus Christ. We can't see our Lord and Savior. It would have been an amazing thing to be one of the disciples. And yet, I often think about that. Would we really have enjoyed being one of the disciples of Jesus, walking around with Him on the earth? He can read your thoughts. <laughs> it's like, oh, 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 you know, oh, how neat it would be to walk with Jesus on the earth. Oh, oh, oh. I mean, he still reads your thoughts, don't get me wrong, but you're not, you know, he's like right there, you know, and, you know, all of a sudden you have some kind of wicked thought and you look over at him and he's just like, you know, just glaring at you and you go, oh, sorry, Lord, <laughs> you know, be something else. But, uh, verse nine, wherefore we labor, working for the Lord. That whether we're present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. The way to stay in good fellowship with the Lord is to work for Him. Do things that are pleasing in His sight. And it's real easy to get out of fellowship with the Lord. You start putting the Bible down. You stop praying. You start listening to the world's music. Watching worldly stuff on the internet. Or, you know, I don't even recommend television. Don't have one in our home. But, you know, all the other stuff that you can do, you can get real worldly. Get away from the Lord. You should be laboring for Him, doing something with your life for Jesus Christ. Look at verse 10. 
For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now what does it say there? That every one may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Verse 9, wherefore we labor. What is it that gets judged at the judgment seat of Christ? Your works. Again, you know, this, this whole easy believe is a movement thing, this free grace uh, system of belief that's just like, believe, and then there doesn't have to be any kind of changed life afterwards. You know, it, it can be or it doesn't have to be. It, you're not going to even think about teaching something so heretical as that if you believe in the judgment seat of Christ. You understand that there are works meet for repentance. There are works that come after your salvation, not to stay saved or to get saved, but good works come as a result of you being born again. That spiritual new birth, all of a sudden you want to serve the Lord. And you're going to start serving the Lord. And if you don't, He's going to chasten you. It's just going to be there. Look at... Uh, let's see here, I've got to change my notes. Trying to do this with one hand. You can look at, uh, we're going to go here in 2 Corinthians to, to chapter 5 to verse uh, 11. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Okay, what did it just say? Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord? What's the terror of the Lord? Well, um, a place called hell, weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth, called outer darkness, eternal, the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, Revelation chapter 14. I would say that's a terror. Yeah. Let me just point a, a little question at you, Christian, and I have to ask myself, how real is hell to you? When you drive out there and you walk out there at the grocery store or wherever else you go, and you look at the vast majority of them people, do you imagine them someday going to hell? Or do you just kind of say, I want to blend in with all this. I don't want to stick out and make a fool out of myself. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. And it isn't just hell, by the way, in eternity. The time of Jacob's trouble is that close <laughs> to coming to pass. I mean, you talk about some of the bad, wild stuff that's going on right now. You know, out in California, they had, uh, I forget what the number was I saw this week, 240-some thousand acres of, of land was burned and over 100,000 people were homeless. Oh, that's nothing time of Jacob's trouble, it's a third of all trees are burned up and all green grass is burned up in one judgment. One judgment. Third of all people killed. One judgment. You know, um, you're not going to be able to bury the people quick enough. One third of all people. I mean, you know, let's just say it this way. I think this town where I live is about 6,000 people or something like that that live in this town, um, a third of that, 2,000 people, 2,000 dead bodies out there, up and down these streets, people in their homes, people out on the street, out in their yard, a third of all people dead. What is that? Uh, the terror of the Lord. Motivation for the judgment seat of Christ. Very convicting. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You know, I, I'm not uh, into the whole hyper soul winning movement, you know, the soul damning movement, I really should call it. Um, this whole thing of going and knocking doors and going out and inviting people to church and whatever else and all this stuff. Uh, I've preached against that. It's, it's unscriptural, especially the Jack Hiles method of quick prayerism and stuff, go out and tell people, you know, give me your little spiel that you practice and practice and rehearse and rehearse and rehearse and 
you got your streets to do on the map that you're trying to get done. That stuff's all nonsense. But I'll tell you what, we all need to remember, do something for the Lord. Gospel tracts are wonderful. I mean, a lot of people, most people nowadays, are scared to death of actually talking to somebody real. Have you ever noticed that? You know, it's more than just the, how you doing? Hi. You know, I mean, try it sometime. Somebody said, how you doing? Say, oh, I'm doing pretty good. How are you doing today? Oh, it's, you know, isn't it interesting? And start talking about it and they'll just be like, oh, okay. They get all nervous and stuff. That's why I think gospel tracts are excellent. Again, you're getting the word of God out there. Even sometimes in the very best conversation that you can have with somebody is something of divine appointment. It's really set up and whatever. Your mind is going to be forgetting scriptures and you're, and, and, and it's, there's all the stuff that enters in there. You get a gospel tract out there. It's got the scriptures on it. Make sure it's King James Bible scriptures. Make sure it has plenty of them on there. You know, you get that gospel tract out there. That person picks it up. Now they have to deal one-on-one -on -one between them and the Lord. They're going to read that thing. And if they decide not to, they crinkle it up and throw it away. They're still, still having to deal with God. I think gospel tracting is great. Talked about that in other videos, but let's continue. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 through 8. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? People were worshiping Paul and Apollos. In other words, um, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Again, God's going to set stuff up for you, brethren. You don't have to worry about being this great, you know, I can answer all the arguments and I've studied for years and years and I'm ready to take on all comers and stuff like this. no. No, God will set things up. God will work things out. And you just your job is just to distribute the Word. I love getting the Word of God out. It's amazing. Okay, verse 8. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Wherefore we labor. Hmm. Verse 9. For we are laborers together with God, Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. Now there's a thought. You're a laborer together with God. Did you ever think of that? Out there in a the store and you're, you're walking along and you get that, it's not an audible, put a track there, you know, no. It's, it's just, it's kind of a, a thought comes into the mind that's not something you would think. And it's like, how about putting a track right there? People sit down on that bench and you look around and you go, Sure. Get it out, you know, and I don't have any tracks here. I had some from another video, but take a tract out and put it down on the bench. Go a little bit further, the Lord says, there's a case of beer, a handle thing on the side that cut out on the cardboard. Put a track there for happy hour. <laughs> you know, what are you doing? You're a laborer together with God. That should blow your mind. I mean, the God of heaven, the creator of the universe, and you as a Christian, you're part of his body, and you're laboring together with him. Hmm. What a thought. Verse 10. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Now here's where it gets really interesting. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ starts your relationship with the Lord. He is the foundation of your salvation. All right. If it's your works, if you're thinking to yourself, well, I can, I can, uh, you know, just kind of work my way and I'll, I'll be pleasing to God. And yeah, I believe in Jesus, but I, I also believe I have to continue and, and obey and things like this and persevere to the end and all. Uh-uh, no. Your foundation is not Jesus Christ. It's your own righteousness. You know, simple as that. But let's look at... Uh, I'm trying to see here where I'm at. Psalm 89, 26. I'll just read this. It says, He shall cry unto me, Thou art my father and 
my God and the rock of my salvation. Jesus Christ is the rock of our salvation, not Peter. All right. Luke 20, verse 18 says, Whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. If you fall on Jesus as a broken sinner, the Lord will fix you. Have that written there. Um, but woe unto the sinners that reject Jesus Christ and mock him. The stone crushes them. Time of Jacob's trouble, it's going to be a lot of crushing. Daniel chapter 2, verses 34 through 35 says, Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, and filled the whole earth. Of course, the great mountain will be the Lord Jesus Christ and the glorified saints during the millennial kingdom. Absolutely right. Now, we know Jesus is the foundation. Now we get into it here. Verse 12. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, Jesus Christ, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. All right. Um, you know, question. Um, of those six things, gold, silver, precious stones, and then you have wood, hay, stubble. Um, which ones are fireproof? Gold, silver, precious stones. And I mean, I realize if you get it hot enough and stuff like that, you can melt the gold and the silver. But my whole point is, you know, just a regular fire, your wood, hay, and stubble is going to be gone like that. Verse 13 through 15. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire. All right. I have to pause here for a minute. I'm going to try to find this thing while I'm talking. Um... This is true for a Christian that your works are tried at the judgment seat of Christ. But if you're a Catholic, uh, and I realize that there are a lot of Catholics that don't really know what their religion really teaches, their false cult really teaches, and but those who do, um, their system actually teaches that you're going to have to burn. It's not your works burn, you burn. It's called purgatory. Uh, I have to look it up in the back here quick. I think it might be in here. They have an index. Give me a moment here. Okay, 170. Just incredible to me how the uh, Catholic Church you know, it just doesn't like the idea of having a, a finished sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It's just this continual thing. Okay? Uh, purgatory is God's hospital. This is page 90 of the Baltimore Catechism. Um, purgatory is God's hospital for souls, where those who do not love God enough to enter heaven are cured by fire. Love is purified, increased, and perfected by suffering. This means not only bodily pain, but crosses of all kinds. There you see it. Get my finger out of the way. And Catholics will actually turn you to, to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 if you don't know your Bible very well. And they'll say, well, the King James, it gets a little bit wrong. It shouldn't be the works. It should be, you know, you. or They'll, they'll come up with some kind of way to get around this thing. Um, and they'll try to say that, you know, uh, well, um, if you have venial sins, okay, they're not mortal sins. Mortal sins send you to hell um, unless you pay the priest enough or, you know, whatever. Um, venial sins, you can't just go at death. You can't just go right into heaven. 
So they have no idea about the blood of Jesus Christ and imputed righteousness. You know, the blood of Jesus Christ is what they drink as cannibals, okay? The blood of Jesus Christ doesn't wash their sins away one time by an act of faith, believing in Jesus' death on the cross. Oh no, it has to be a continual, perpetual thing that you just, you're always drinking the blood and drinking the blood. You know, sick pagan cult that it is. Uh, they don't believe in the blood and they don't believe in the imputed righteousness where Jesus Christ gives you his righteousness. That's why I can die five minutes from now and absent from the body present with the Lord. Boom, right to heaven. No need for further purification. He say, well, then you won't be judged? Oh no, my, my works are gonna be judged. What I've done for the Lord will be judged. But me, personally, nope. My judgment ended at the cross. And I got I gave my filthy, worthless life to Jesus Christ, and He gave me His perfect, sinless life. He imputed His righteousness to me. Wonderful thing. Okay. So, I have here my little funny way of saying it. Let's take a trip to the heavenly hardware store. Okay, you're to build upon a foundation, the foundation being Jesus Christ. So let's go. It's ironic because we just came back from a building place, you know, had to get some materials for some work that we're doing. Um, but uh, we're going to build upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. So let's check out these different materials that we can build with. Gold. What does gold mean? All right. Saw that there in verse 12. What is gold? That's your relationship and service to God. Revelation 3, verse 18. Revelation 3, 18. It says here, to the Laodicean church, lukewarm people, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Gold tried in the fire. Hmm. Every man's work shall be tried in the fire. Uh, how do you get that gold? Revelation 19, verse 8, talks about white raiment there in uh, uh, verse 18. White and white raiment there. Revelation uh, 19, verse 8 says, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Okay? Now I have here the uh, Laodicean believers are lacking in three things. Number one, their lovers are pleasures more than lovers of God. Second Timothy 3, verse 4 talks about that. And we can all fall into this thing, you know? It isn't just, oh, the modern church or something like this. Uh, but him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. No white raiment. They conform to the world and have no righteousness. And number three, they can't see the truth. They are spiritually blind. Yeah. Revelation 3, verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Again, if you're hearing this stuff and you're getting pricked in the heart and saying, you know what? I am kind of a little bit lukewarm and I, I do miss opportunities. I'm kind of out of fellowship with the Lord. Be zealous. Repent. Change what you're doing. All right? Lamenta Lamentations chapter 4. Back to the Old Testament. Lamentations chapter 4. in between Jeremiah and Ezekiel, by the way, if you don't know. Lamentation, Lamentation chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. It says here, How has the gold become dim? How has the most fine gold changed? The stones of the sanctuary are poured out in the top of every street. The precious sons of Zion, comparable to fine gold, how are they esteemed as earthen pitchers, the work of the hands of the potter? Hmm. That's kind of an interesting thing, isn't it?
Okay, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Again, you know, you want God and his righteousness, you're going to have to do more things to be more like the Lord and to try and live for the Lord. Okay, I have written here too, the, read Galatians 5, 19 through 26 sometime and examine your own life. The lust of the flesh is the dross that keeps you from the golden, that golden kingdom of God. The fruits of the Spirit will bring you gold at the judgment seat of Christ. Again, you know, when you burn gold, when it's tried in the fire, impurities will come out of that gold. That's the dross that will be scraped off. Okay, let's look at the next one. Silver. What is silver? Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Verse 12, 1 Corinthians 3, 12. So what is silver? Turn to Psalm. Psalm 12. Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7. It says here, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Unless you're a new virginist and you try to change that verse to try to get away from God preserving his word. Kind of weird why people would do that. But I've seen that thing many, many times. Well, it's not talking about the word of God, it's talking about people. Kind of a strange thing. I'll turn over to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Okay. We're not going to read all the verses. But just look at this. Read through this sometime if you haven't ever read Psalm 119. Take a little bit of time there. But look at it. What's the whole thing about? Is it about winning souls? No. Is it about salvation? No, not really. What's it about? The Word of God. You might... Uh, I guess, I guess you could say that uh, this, the most important thing to God is His Word. I mean, the biggest chapter, it's a psalm, I realize, but the biggest chapter in the entire Bible is completely about the Word of God. God's commandments, God's laws, written Scripture. I mean, again, think of what God, the Creator of, the hev of heaven and earth, think about what He's done creates the universe and then he says I'm going to write this thing in a book and make sure you can have a copy of it and we shouldn't revere this book we shouldn't be glad for this book yes we should look at Psalm 138 verse 2 so you're worshiping the book you're worshiping the Bible no actually I'm not Psalm 138, verse 2. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Yeah, God's, word, uh, God's word is very, very important. Excuse me, I'm a little tongue-tied right now. God's word is extremely important. And again, you've seen it out there. Saw so one of you in the comments wrote and said that, you know, you just started to talk about the Word of God with somebody, a co-worker, and the guy got angry, you know, professing Christian, got angry. You always got to wonder about that when a, when a Christian gets mad at the Word of God being talked about. Yeah, false convert. But, uh, you know, guy was just started talking about the Bible, and this older man that was a professing Christian got all mad and angry, reported the guy to his boss, and the guy got in trouble. Yeah. Why? This book isn't like other books. This book is God's book. This King James Bible. 2 Thessalonians 3, 1. Second Thessalonians 3, 1. Back to the New Testament.
Okay, it says here, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. Let me just explain something to you. A Bible-believing Christian is one. You know, we don't worship the Bible. I don't put this thing on a stand someplace and offer up prayers to it or something like that. Certainly not. But we understand the importance of this book. And um, when we glorify this book, it's because we're using it. We're quoting it. And all these people come along and they say, well, yes, but, you know, you try to debate a Catholic and they'll bring up church fathers and this guy said this and that one said that. And Protestants will talk about Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and all these different things. Systematic theology and blah, blah, blah. It's the Bible. I'm going to... That the uh, you know pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. That's my prayer. That's the whole point of this ministry, King James Video Ministries. That's this whole what this whole thing is about. I mean, years and years and years ago, I was studying a lot of the conspiracy stuff and just seeing how the world's going. And and I thought to myself, you know what? What should I spend my time doing? What should I you know uh, talk about and and What's the most important thing for me to do with my life? Glorify this book through preaching it, through teaching it, through teaching you out there that this is your final authority. People accuse me all the time of being a cult leader and all this stuff. I'm not a cult leader. If I was a cult leader, I'd get rid of this book. I showed the video where Jim Jones took the book, took the Bible, and he, he threw it out into the congregation. And he said... That this book has oppressed, oppressed you black people long enough. You don't need that book. And he threw it. I'm never going to do that. This is your final authority. Not me. What about precious stones? We had gold. We had silver. Gold is the righteousness of God. Silver is the written word of God. What about precious stones? Revelation 21. Revelation 21, verses 9 through 21. Okay, it says here, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. So you have there the bride, the lamb's wife, and she's likened to a precious stone. Hmm. Verse 12. And had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, and on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city, and the gates thereof, and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed twelve thousand furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof an hundred and forty and four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is of the angel. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold like unto clear glass. The righteousness of God is going to be there, but it's likened to a gem, basically, to like a precious stone. Clear gold. So what is that? I have no idea. Something in heaven that we can't experience here on earth. Verse 19, And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones, the first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third a chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth a topaz, the tenth a chrysoprasus, the eleventh a jacinth, the twelfth an amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every, one, uh, every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. Hmm. An interesting thing there. Precious stones. 
in eternity, you can clearly see what it is. What does uh, Proverbs 31.10 say? Well, it says, Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? A virtuous woman, a saved woman, her price is far above rubies compared to precious stones. Kind of an interesting thing. Turn to Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. The devil likes to counterfeit things. Daniel chapter 11. Verse 37 and 38. It says here, Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces. Okay, it's talking about the Antichrist here. And a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Hmm. And, it, you know, you read over in Ezekiel 28, I think it is, where it talks about the devil being the anointed cherub that covereth, and he had gold and, you know, precious stones on him as well. Interesting. Very interesting. I want to show you something else really kind of neat as well. Turn back to Revelation chapter 18. Revelation 18, verses 11 through 12. another little uh, satanic counterfeit here we have talking about mystery Babylon the mighty city verse 10 or that mighty city verse 11 and the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore the merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all thigh and wood and all manner of vessels of ivory, and all manner of vessels of most precious wood, and of brass, and iron, and marble. Hmm. Kind of an interesting thing. And it's, you know, something I want to point out here too. And that is, in verse 12, 11 and 12, it's talking about merchants buying and selling things. There. But look at the materials that make up the city in verse 16, that make up Babylon. Revelation 18, verse 16, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. What was missing? Silver. Um, what is this book? Silver. So, they can sell the Word of God. They can try to make money off of it, which is exactly what all the new versions are. They're big money-making schemes that all the new versions go back to the Vatican, the Vatican's manuscripts and things like that. So they can make merchandise of the, the Word of God, but the city itself is not constructed with the Word of God. There's no silver in Mystery Babylon. That's what you call significant. Look at uh, Revelation 17, verse 4. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet collar and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Again, the woman is described, this city, she's described and she has no silver. I mean, when's the last time you saw the Pope going someplace carrying under his arm the Bible? Like this. Goes to meet some, with some world leader and he says, let me show you what the Word of God says today, partner. Vicar of Christ, and yet he won't carry a Bible. Won't preach from the Bible. Sure, sure. I don't think so. So, that is going to be it for this study. We're going to go on to part two now. 
and uh, um, we're going to talk about the wood hay and stubble. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure how much time are we in here. Yeah, we'll quit for now. We'll be back in part two with the wood hay and stubble. So that is going to be it. Thank you for watching.